So Hello, welcome. My name is Paul Hamblin. I'm editor of Logistics Business, uh, and you've joined the latest in our series of expert panels that are part of the Logistics Business virtual show. The theme for this particular panel is automation, automation in the DC in its myriad forms. And I'm delighted to say we've been joined by an expert team from across the globe to talk about um, that theme, which, of, which as we know, is just so varied and so important and is the future of warehousing and distribution. Um, this, this panel is not about formal sales pitches. It's not about death by PowerPoint. The idea is just to get the experts to talk about their expertise and hopefully inform your decision making in the months and years ahead. So without further ado, can I ask each uh, member of the panel just to introduce themselves very briefly and then we'll crack on. So should we start with you, Varta? Yes, thank you, uh, Paul. Pleasure being in this session today. Um, uh, yes, at Wouter Lomans, responsible for um, the warehousing activities within MHS. So basically, we help our customers um, providing the uh, the solutions for inbound and outbound sortation solutions. I'm more than 50 years in the business. I've been working first for a company called DistriSort, more single item sortation solutions then a uh, software company, Prime Vision, and now for the last six years with First and Reed and now MHS. Gianni? Yes, Hi, Robotics is the inventor of the Hypic. It's a ACR, that's an autonomous case handling robotic system. Uh, so we offer flexible high density T2P, or I should say tote person picking solutions. So since 2015, when we first invented the ACR, we have now over 2000 robots running around in more than 300 projects in different industries. Thank you. Now, Uana. Hello, everyone. I'm Uana, and I'm co-founder and CCO at Bots and Us. And we are a robotics company based here in the UK. Uh, we've been around for about seven years, but um, kind of more significantly looking at the logistics sector for the past year. Um, our solution looks after data collection uh, inside warehouses. So we automate a big part of the acceptance process and the album process, but also stock taking um, and creating kind of digital twins of, of warehouses. And last but not least, uh, Jamie. Hi, I'm Jamie Thomas. I work for Pilts Automation. Uh, we are machinery safety, predominantly um, products and solutions and services provider. Uh, I myself have been with Pilts for nine years in roles, uh, various roles within the company. Um, prior to that, I worked as an engineer uh, and spent um, six years actually working in the in the warehouse and the logistics industry. So. Fantastic. So let's get into the subject of automation then. Um, and as I've said before, it's and as we've seen from your short descriptions there, it's incredibly varied. Um, I think which what I should probably do is ask each of you now in turn to talk about the solutions that you offer to the market. Uh, and the benefits that they bring to your customers. Um, so spend a few minutes, each of you, talking about this. And if, if I start with you, Val, to tell us about yeah. MHS and what you do. Yeah, well, MHS is a global system integrator. We provide turnkey solutions for customers around the globe. Um, mainly, we do a lot of projects, for instance, for the parcel handling business, so parcel conveyors and parcel sorters. But since last year, we do more and more e-commerce projects, projects for 3 pl companies. And there we see a huge demand in, in kind of sortation solutions, predominantly, for instance, for outbound sortation. So you have to imagine um, deadlines are getting shorter. For instance, a customer is ordering uh, a product at 10 o'clock and it still needs to be delivered next day. And what you see, for instance, is that the picking will be then done. Uh, and those parcels need to be sorted directly to the outbound line holes of the parcel companies. And there we help and support our customers, for instance. Um, other things we see in the market nowadays, it's uh, sustainability is a big topic. So there is a huge demand in returns handling systems. Um, with MHS, we serve customers providing those kind of solutions um, where basically you have an inbound kind of grading area and an outbound flow. Um, so all kind of solutions we offer. Um, MHS in Europe, we basically um, have different solutions from really uh, uh, small solutions um, up to really yeah, bigger kind of solutions. So you could imagine it could be just a simple conveyor line up to uh, maybe a cross belt sorter sorting 50,000 parcels per hour. And that highly depends on the customer needs, basically. 
And what we always try to do is um, go to the customer, have a discussion, have a cup of coffee, see what are the challenges. Every, every customer can have different challenges. For instance, one customer has a problem with the quality. The other one say, okay, I have to keep up with the growth. But the biggest challenge we currently see in the market and perhaps the other people in this uh, round will recognize it as well is the lack of people for the warehouse. There is a kind of, um, yeah, you, at the end you are dependent in a certain way to the, you don't want to be dependent on the people in your warehouse at the end too much and have a continuous uh, kind of operation. And there basically we support our, our customers with, with solutions basically. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Can I just before I just move on, Val, can I ask you? You mentioned something today, which I think is a really growing area of importance within retail logistics, which is returns handling. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about your solution there? Because I know that returns is a growing area in terms yeah. of cost for 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 retailers and for their logistics partners. Yeah, you have to imagine. I mean, um, people buy stuff. Um, uh, for instance, if you uh, buy clothing or, or shoes, whatever, uh, you buy the product and sometimes they buy different pairs and all those returns are coming back to a kind of uh, logistic center. So you send it back, you bring it to the parcel office, but then it starts, basically, it needs to be handled. And what you see there is that uh, basically there are different categories to returns. Uh, a, a articles, B articles, and C articles. A articles are basically articles which will go back to the fulfillment center. Uh, B articles, they will be brought at the end to a kind of outlet. And C articles, they go basically to the you know, waste disposal, you more or less could say. And in order to maintain that and to handle that, you need a kind of automation system to do that in a smooth way. So what we already do at the beginning, we have an inbound sortation. So we classify the products and we already can recognize, okay, this could be A article, could be B article, could be a C article. So we do a kind of sortation. And then basically we bring those articles to kind of workstations. And what is done at those workstations, for instance, is um, a kind of refurbishment, kind of inspection. And based on the inspection and refurbishment, they will be also sorted to different, uh, different areas. Um, so the whole conveyor infrastructure to, to process this flow um, and the sortation is provided by MHS uh, at several customers around Europe, basically. Um, and we see more and more demand coming for kind of similar solutions to that. Um, so a lot of customers are asking for this because normally it was a kind of part of the warehouse somewhere in the corner of the warehouse. And now you see because the flow is still increasing because the volumes are going up. You need basically separate warehouses in order to handle this flow of products. And that's what we are currently uh, currently providing. And I know it's difficult because you have, you know, clients sometimes don't like this sort of information to be released, but no. have you got a sense of what sort of improvements in time that your sourcing solutions can give um, and in cost savings to clients? Can you just give a sense of what the variations might be? Yeah. Still, of course, there's a, work, a lot of work to do in refurbishment uh, and inspection. That's something which is hardly to automate because, yeah, it's manual labor. But what we saw at some of the business cases, we were basically able to achieve a 20 to 30 percent reduction in labor in a warehouse. If you would compare it just to a normal kind of standard operation with a manual process. Uh, so that's significantly, uh, and certainly, if you have to handle maybe 10 or 15,000 items per per hour, you need a lot of people doing that. Um, yeah, there we see the savings already coming in. Sure. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Valter. We'll come back to you later if we may. Uh, let's, let's move on to Gianni. Gianni, tell us all about high robotics. Yeah. So we focus on the total person automation, uh, and so in our solution, robotics are very central. And this makes it uh, modular and also very scalable. So it can go from very big to very small to give some ideas. It can be an e-commerce you know, uh, fulfillment center. Uh, it can be a spare parts warehouse, it can be integration with a manufacturing line, or even as small as micro fulfillment center, like we did three uh, MFCs in Holland last year. Just, just um, tell our audience, just for those who aren't aware, just, say what, just explain what micro fulfillment is. Yeah, so uh, in the case of, uh, you know, for, uh, for in Holland, where you have the new Okama brand, it's a, it's a grocery store. So their clients will buy groceries on their phone uh, to take groceries as, as, a, as a sector. So they will buy groceries on their phone or on, on the, online. 
and it will go to the store to pick them up. So we will call this uh, a micro fulfillment center. And it's micro because it's very small. So typically it's also very different than DCs, which are usually in far areas out of, of the urban centers. Micro fulfillment centers are usually inside the urban centers. So they're small. They're also usually old locations. So it's like an existing location that you need to refurbish, that you need to automate. Right. And that we talk with your with your robots solutions, are they AMR solutions or do you have a variety? Talk about those a bit. Yeah, so we focus on, so if you talk about AMR, typically what we had uh, in the market for, uh, for I think 15 years or even more already is the Kiva type of uh, AMRs. We, we call it shelf AMRs, shelf to person AMRs. So this is uh, typically what you see at Amazon. Uh, and so what these do is moving shelves to workstations and their people have to pick the goods from the shelves. So what our type of AMR do, we call it ACR. It's, all, uh, it's a case handling robot. So what it does, it takes five to eight totes on its body and moves the individual totes or cartons to the picking station. So obviously, as you can imagine, it, it has, uh, I think maybe two major advantages is uh, if you look at shelf AMRs, typically the storage density is, is limited because you have the shelves, which are typically maximum 2.5 meters in height, where we can go up to 10 meters in height. And then of course, in terms of efficiency, where you put an individual carton to the, to the picking station, it's uh, not, not difficult to imagine that it's more efficient than, uh, than uh, picking from a shelf. Yeah, what uh, Walter was mentioning is the uh, sorting systems that he uses in, uh, for example, return handling. Uh, there also, we see a lot of applications where we integrate with sorters. So where sorters move the totes to different storage locations and our robots will pick the totes uh, directly from the sorter into the warehouse. So it allows for a full automatic, uh, you know, uh, solution. Now, I think maybe one uh, advantage or one, one characteristic of AMRs over the industry, depend, you know, <laughs> independent of what kind of AMRs, is that the, uh, the automation of the warehouse is fairly quick. So usually we have less than one month to, to put the hardware in place. And so this is minimum on impact on the operations. Okay. And our same question I asked Walter, really, can you give us a sense of what sort of improvements in efficiencies you can provide for your customers with these? Systems? Yes, so, uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a good question. So I think uh, what, we, what we try to do with this solution uh, is really combining the, you know, the advantage of robotics is that it's low entry, it's uh, quite uh, budget friendly, affordable, it's flexible. But the limitations used to be what I said, you know, the low storage density uh, and less efficient picking than systems like, for example, auto store or multi, multi shuttle systems. And so what we try to do is combine the uh, flexibility and the affordability of robotics, modular, scalable, with the high density and the fast picking of multi shuttle systems, right? So yeah. it's, I think that, that's really the key of, of using uh, robotics in general. It's scalable. Uh, it can be implemented in phases, for example. You know, if you have, a, uh, to give you an example, we have a, a client with manufacturing line. So it's like uh, operations 24 on 7, 365 days a year. So they don't stop. So what we do there is we split the warehouse into two parts. First, putting one side of the warehouse into operations. And then, well, the one half is already operational, we start doing also the second half. Right. I'm going to come back to you on that later in the discussion, if I may, about implementation and affordability. Uh, but meanwhile, yes. let's, uh, let's move on to Oana. Oana, tell us about uh, Bots and Us, the company you co-founded. Sure. So maybe I'll, I'll take a small step back and just talk a bit about the, the kind of the warehouse process, because I think quite a few of the solutions that you see currently in robotics and automation focus on the picking and packing side of things. So kind of the last mile of, of what's happening in a warehouse, whereas what we think is there's a lot of efficiencies you can actually bring everything beforehand so around the acceptance process, around the put away process, around the, the kind of storage elements, just like stock taking and keep an eye on inventory um, and replenishment as well. 
to then make sure that by the time we get to the picking and packing, everything's kind of uh, worked flawlessly, which obviously will will take to a um, kind of happy customer at the end of it when they receive the the, the orders. So we focus on on the other bits, not the picking and packing, um, by basically automating data collection. So we have autonomous robots that literally move around the warehouse and collect all kinds of different data points. Um, and I think just to, to kind of explain a little bit step by step, uh, when it comes to the acceptance process, as the pallets are being offloaded of trucks, our robots go around one pallet or like multiple pallets in a row, kind of instantly digitize the consignment, uh, literally creating a 3D version of it. And from there, start to extract all kinds of information about what has been received. So firstly, identifying the, the packages based on barcodes or QR codes, whatever kind of labels are, are on them. Uh, then looking at dimensioning, from that I'm mentioning, then kind of extrapolating the number of items on the pallet. So basically anything that um, one of one of the kind of staff would have done with a clipboard in their hand and kind of taking boxes of handheld scanner in to, to get the goods into, into the warehouse. And then exactly the same robots, exactly the same technology, navigate between the shelves and kind of instantly create a real-time digital twin of the warehouse by placing every single package of single item um, on a 3D map. So you can kind of constantly find anything in the warehouse, obviously counting it uh, in the same technology, but also looking at um, identifying gaps on the shelves. So as the robots scan the shelf, it will also kind of tell you what, um, what percentage of each kind of cube is occupied. So is it a 10% filled uh, cube? Is it a 100% filled? Is it actually an empty one? which then extrapolating with the data from the WMS can kind of flag things such as like, there should be something here actually isn't, why is that? Or by the way, this volume of this particular item is getting to a critical a level. So it should be replenished to, to be able to kind of fulfill the picking um, part at the end. So our, our kind of core, core element is, is data. Um, and we kind of feel like it's gonna be the number one element that's really gonna boost digital transformation in, in logistics, whether that's cargo handling, whether that's e-commerce, whether that's manufacturing. So kind of working across the, the board um, to try and, and kind of take away some of those tasks and make them much more efficiently. Yeah, because we're looking from what you're saying, it looks like it's about efficiency and it's also about accuracy, presumably, is that exactly. right? Exactly. Exactly. And I think a, a, a lot of the time, I mean, um, well, in, in terms of what solutions exist out there, obviously you'll have your, your teams with their tape measurements in hand, and like I was saying, handheld scanners. Um, usually the, these guys um, have to kind of do cycle counts of the warehouse. So it takes a pretty long time to, to fulfill a whole warehouse. Uh, for one of our customers, it's, it's, for example, about six weeks to really count the whole um, warehouse. By the time that's done, it's obviously completely irrelevant because what had happened in the beginning, it's, it's already outdated. Um, so you have that element of, like you're saying, accuracy, but also the continuation of the data, because we can scan continuously and at any time kind of make sure that what's happening on the warehouse floor is what the WMS is, is saying and kind of correcting any errors. And, and where are you based, uh, Uana Bots and Us? So we're actually based in, in Bermondsey in London. Um, so we make robotics in central London. <laughs> Obviously our supply chain is, is all over the UK and Europe and, and even like Asia, but we assemble the robots um, in in-house in Bermondsey. Um, yeah, and from there kind of distribute and, and, and work with our, our networks around Europe. Okay, thank you for that. And now, last but not least, Jamie, tell us a bit about Pilt. All right, um, yes, yeah, so as I said, Pilt, we're predominantly machinery safety, although we do uh, standard automation solutions as well. Um, but what we do is, is we can, we, we're not going to design anything uh, groundbreaking like the guys that have been just speaking to from a solutions perspective, but we kind of fit in with uh, the end users, the machine builders, the integrators. So all parts of the parts of the process and, and what we offer might, might vary. So um, currently we're working on a, on, a, on a new logistics center going in and and we're working for the end user, so we've been carrying out design review risk assessments of the, the OEM's machinery. Uh, and then once they've been built, we're using one of our other subsidiaries because we have sort of presence in, in over 40 countries around the world to offer uh, consultancy services, product solutions, etc. So we are then using one of the, of the subsidiaries to inspect the machine, do risk assessments, EHSR, SOE compliance checks of all the basically the whole warehouse is it's going to be built modularly um, and their pallet cranes to automated conveyor solutions, et cetera. And we will pick up any non-conformances there with the machine and, and work alongside the, the OEM. So it's not a case of, um, uh, of, of pulling the machine apart, it's working together. And then they can put any of these non-conformances right before the machine's shipped 
then and in this case to the UK. So once it comes into the UK, it will be installed and we will then do a, a, a full and final risk assessment compliance checks, EHSR, SOE compliance checks, validations, and then post-Brexit with things coming in, we can help with the UKCA marking side of things, be the authorised representative. So the idea, and then and there's also OEMs that will use us for a very similar thing, just to check their machines. to say, well, actually, you know, you're talking AMR, so obviously you've got 3691 part four, which is the, the key standard for them. And some of the guys talking robotics, so you'd be looking at 10218 part two. So there's lots of key parts in these standards that you need to make compliance to. Mm -hmm as well as the other associated B standards, the generic ones for, for interlocking and guarding and safe to let parts of the control system, et cetera. So we can offer and support with our knowledge of these standards and the finer details and um, support people with uh, and companies with that. The other side of the, one of the other sides of the business is that we also support with, with solutions. So if you've got, you've got concepts of how you want your safety relate control systems to work or, or how people are going to interact with machinery. Um, you may, you guys may build the same machinery for, for three different customers and have three different interactions dependent upon the end users requirements and, and their cultures and, and maybe even just the product that they're, they're putting in into, into your machines and solutions. So we can work and, and go through these sort of solutions as well. Um, and it, it's, it's a support that, that we offer really. As much as anything, who's, um, who's appointing you, Jamie? Who are you working for? Are you working for the end user client, or are you working for the integrator or the OEM? We work for all sorts. We work we we work with end users, integrators, OEMs. Um, yeah, we 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 do work with all with all different types. We're uh, we, we're not focused on one more than the other, uh, and everything we do is impartial. So it's not a case of um, you know, we just go, we, we apply the standards to the machines with the guys that we've got. I mean, in the UK, we've got 10 consultants. We also have a team of engineers designing safety solutions as well. So is, is the benefit then that you're an independent voice, as it were, between, for example, say the customer and, and the OEM or the integrator? Is that is that the benefit of having you there? Quite often, yeah, because, you know, um, uh, I think some of it as well, I mean, it, within, within automation, PILTS is, is renowned for, for machinery safety. So, um, you know, so that, that's, our, that's our niche, that's our, yeah. our, our, our area of expertise. So, um, yeah, so, and Pete, again, various people will have, will have different reasons for, for employing a consultancy service. I mean, machinery safety is such a fluid topic. You know, in the last handful of years, the emergency stops um standards changed safe related parts control system interlocking's changed recently that's under review again you know so there's various and then all the c type standards and they're constantly being reviewed so it's not easy to stay on top and, and abreast of it unless you've got someone focused on it and, and but that's what we do that's our that's our job um and like you said it's an impartial view so there's no there's no agenda behind anything we do. We, we say it as we see it. I think we're pretty pragmatic in what in how we approach things as well because the regard, majority of our guys have been, been engineers, whether electrical or mechanical or both. And um, so we, we try and a bit of a real world approach to, to machinery safety, but, but also, you know, with the, with the idea of making sure you've got a safe solution at the end of the, at the end and of the compliance, day. of course, as you mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Moving on to some broader questions, then I think the I think the biggest change, sea change that I've seen in terms of media for automation, is that up to now, or until recently, it was seen as something only for the really big beasts, whereas now it's becoming something that's, you know, SMEs more affordable. So can we talk a bit about that and go around each of you in turn? Um, Jamie's perspective might be slightly different, but I'd be interested to get his too on. You know, is it something that's now becoming within reach of smaller businesses who pre previously would not have wanted to contemplate the levels of investment that were required? So let me start, come back to you again, Val. So do you want to talk a bit about that? Yes, sure. Um, yeah, I definitely recognize that. I mean, what I already said, dependency on people, you want to avoid that too much. Um, 
So maybe a couple of years ago, people were only looking at the business case. Can I save enough stuff on my um, in my operation? And then can I justify the business case for buying a new system? But now other elements are coming in. It's also about quality. Uh, for instance, um, well, if you send the parcel to the wrong address at the end of the day, the customer gets disappointed, is less loyal, etc. So a lot of reasons are around there to justify the investment in automation. And what I said, I think the strong thing about MHS is that we can basically serve customers, I mean, from a small conveyor up to kind of big system for, for a hub. And we can also grow along with our customers. So perhaps maybe today you start, okay, I, I open a new kind of e-commerce uh, center, maybe for a couple of thousand products per hour, what you need to handle. And maybe in the future, you will grow to a company like similar to, I don't know, a bigger player in the market. And I think what makes us, um, what differentiates us from others is that we really can grow along with the customer there. And I, yeah, I see that. Um, so we have a wide um, uh, portfolio of customers from big to small. Um, and as I said, I think the main reason behind that is that there are different reasons behind it. Um, when I started in the business 50 years ago, it was impossible for instance to sell a sorting system or equipment to a 3PL company. And nowadays, my biggest group of customers are 3PL companies because they say it's not only about the business case, but it's also that we want to avoid that dependency too much on, uh, on stuff in the warehouse. Give us a sense of the range of, of you, you talked about you do from small to large. What, yeah. would, be the, what would be the smallest uh, project you've done and the largest? In value, you mean, uh, Paul? In terms of number of sorters, you know, number of yeah, uh, yeah. sorting sockets. Yeah, it can be. It can be what I said. Can be just uh, 200 meters of conveyors, for instance, up to now we're building a mega hub uh, in the Midlands for a big parcel operator, and then you talk about multiple sorters, multiple cross belt sorters, for instance. Um, so also in the in the range of products of uh, of project size, it can start for 100,000 euros up to maybe uh, a project of uh, 50 million or 100 million euros. So that's the range where we are active. Um, and we see also customers having, say, smaller and bigger operations. So also for us, it's interesting to connect to, to customers um, who come back every time. You can learn from each other. You can connect. The project team uh, starts to understand each other better and better every project. Um, so maybe you as a customer say, OK, I'd just like to start with the first with a small project. I just want to taste uh, how you work and then well if you're there then we go to do a bigger project for instance sure um, affordability Gianni and you're in this key area of robotics and AMRs is it, is it actually cheaper than people think uh, yeah it's a very good question I think that the reason why you have automation increasing I think on the one hand the cost of automation is going down but I don't think it's really you know, at the same level as human labor cost yet. So it's still a higher, and it's a capex investment. So it's also a higher risk, I would say, than human labor investment. But then you have the other benefits that people are looking for, like uh, the storage density, the more precise picking uh, efficiency. Um, and so I think what we also see now is this, this uh, increasing use of robotics, uh, like Awala probably will also... Uh, uh, have experienced with her business is that robotics really integrate quite easily in existing infrastructure, existing hardware. So for example, if you take uh, shelves as an example, if you look at uh, traditional like multi-shuttle uh, automation systems, these uh, really force you to do a total uh, rebuild of your warehouse and you know, get a totally new custom-made infrastructure while, while robotics uh, often can integrate with your existing hardware, like for example, shelves, totes, cartons, they can be reused. And if you consider that shelves take about 40% of the hardware cost, then that's uh, yeah, a qu quite significant savings that you get there on the total overall budget. So if you look at robotics use of, uh, uh, you know, in, in automation, I think usually we look at two to three years of return on investment. I was going to ask you that question. Is that a general view that that's what we're looking at as a as a as a broad response, two to three years, or can it vary within that period depending on the size of the project? Uh, it can vary. Um, it can vary, uh, but I think three years is uh, 
you should see it more like a maximum. So that's like par, yeah. Okay. Yes, and then of, of course, what you also have to, you know, when you maybe when you look at automation and what in terms of costs, I think you have two two types of costs. First is the capex, the investment that you make. Then you also have the running costs. Uh, if you look at the running costs, uh, maybe you mentioned uh, AMRs or or like I introduced maybe shelf AMRs as. as In, 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 in some robotics, you know, some robotics like the Hypic allows for full automation. So it integrates with sorters, it integrates robotic arms. Uh, shelf AMRs, as an example, need uh, human labor. Also picking assisted AMRs, they need human labor. So also this is, you know, if you look at the Kiva type of robot, the capex will be lower. Yeah, maybe let's say 30% cheaper or, or maybe even to 50% cheaper than are kinds of ACRs because the prices are, are what, what they are. Uh, but you have the operational costs. So you look at 30% more people who help the robots in the pick, picking. You look at 30% more warehouse space, which is uh, you know, your, year, your yearly cost. So this, this is, it's the global picture. You have to take into consideration both the investment costs and then the operational costs. Thank you for that, Gianni. Um, Uanda, we know that data is king, is it not? So tell us a bit about that in terms of, I'm, I'm sort of tying it in with affordability. I know it's slightly, slightly vague, but can you, can you tell a bit, talk a bit about that? Yes, um, and I think, um, well, I can, I can, I'll take kind of two, two sides of the question. Number one, I just wanted okay. to say that Gianni is like, yeah, absolutely right. I think there's, there's two elements there. Number one is um, the, the way we, we look at the reason for like wider adoption. Number one is infrastructure. So the easier it is to integrate into existing infrastructure, obviously the faster it's gonna be adopted. So from our perspective, our solution can be dropped into any warehouse connected to Wi-Fi, and it kind of starts going. So there's no need for significant kind of changes to the warehouse or, or anything like that. Uh, and then when it comes to, to the affordability, like we operate the robot as a service business model. So it's a monthly kind of fee for, for the, oh, okay. the service that we provide. So the, the robots are there to, to yeah, become those the people eyes basically rather than the people themselves. Um, and yeah, when it comes to data, I think it's, it's very interesting because you can see an immediate kind of cost benefit from it. And um, like, it could be very direct in terms of, um, of well, the ROIs that we were talking about earlier. Um, it, can, it can kind of push for that 98, 99% space utilization by identifying the gaps. Uh, you can save thousands of hours by kind of finding things around the warehouse. I think uh, one of our customers was saying it takes about 25 minutes to find a pallet once it goes missing. Um, on average, some are, mm -hmm. some are never found. <laughs> um, so it's a very kind of like, yeah, one-to-one -one get this information, I can save this amount of money. But the beauty of it comes on the longer term when you can actually see patterns, you can actually see how things are progressing in time and in space. Um, and there's a lot of interesting things that the data teams of our customers are looking at to optimize um, um, processes by simulating things online, looking at that digital twin aspect, uh, trying something else in the digital world and they're implementing in the physical. So when you have a, a real time model of what's happening in the warehouse in the digital world, you can play with it in multiple ways versus some of the current solutions which rely on doing a, a model once and you use that for like months and months in a row rather than kind of having that real time data feed. So that's where it comes interesting because you can't really put a price on the data anymore. Um, and, and there's a lot of in interesting ideas that we constantly hear from, from customers. When it comes to space, actually a lot of them are looking to monetize um, uh, extra space that they have. So kind of constantly knowing how much is on shelf available to be able to be so sold on the space market, if you, if you want to go like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's all kinds of extra interesting benefits that we haven't even thought about when we started um, and they're all coming up. So yeah, it's, it's, it's all part of the conversation with the customer and really kind of uh, looking at the insights, turning them on all the different sides and helping them make the most of them. Yeah, so are we saying the technology almost is so new that we don't even know what the full benefits are yet, and that it may turn out being used very differently to how you guys are exactly, yeah. exactly. Jamie, coming on to you, this feels obviously affordability isn't really quite the question when we're talking about safety, is it? There's no compromise on that, um, and it's got to be done for. So, is that something you, you can talk about in terms of pilts, or is it? Um... Yeah, well, yeah. From what we, the way we approach things, actually. There's lots of instances where, where people will be buying machinery and it will turn up on site and there are non-compliances. Uh, and maybe someone like ourselves will go in or even local health and safety teams. And then when they're identified, 
the machine can't be put into service. So from a, from an OEM perspective, there may be penalties and things like that if they've not mm. if they've not um, satisfied all the requirements, um, or if they're not picked up and there's accidents. Then from an end user perspective, then there's implications there, which which may be picked up under. Uh, which wouldn't be an, an OEM responsibility. Then the end user may employ someone like ourselves to go in and do the pure assessments. And then we pick up all these issues again and it starts going back and forth. So especially from the pre-delivery um, inspection perspective, anything that's wrong can be picked up at the front end. And, you know, so the, the loss, the, the cost of that can pay for itself 10 times over. Um, by from an OEM perspective, for them being able to rectify things in their own workshops at the place where the machine is built and designed mm-hmm. um, and not doing it on site, uh, maybe having to get local contractors flying parts in and out, but also in loss of time and penalties and things like that when machinery maybe is on the shop floor, can't be used, needs upgrading, it's taking up space. The, 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 maybe the old machinery has been pulled out and new machinery has been put in, you can't complete the job, etc. So there's lots of areas where actually the safety can can assist but then also from a solutions perspective safety and productivity shouldn't be in competition they should complement each other and and the right solutions can make the machine better easier to use safe mode applications things like that for setting teaching all these different all these different um requirements that are done with the machine and also the, the sort of machine tending loading and loading etc interaction with these machines um, if you get it right and you get the right people involved, then, then these things can really be a, a massive benefit and not just uh, and a massive cost saving, not just not just as a as a as a hindrance of cost. The have you, guys here again. Jamie, have you ever had instances where your guys have turned up on site and there's been a horror show about to happen if you hadn't been there to, you know, supervise it as it were? Uh, well, I, I would say it's not that uncommon. <laughs> <laughs> Good enough. Um, I mean, to the point where I mean, I don't think there's 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 never been a machine or a system, um, new, old, designed or whatever that our guys haven't turned up and found issues with. Right. Uh, well, and some of them are quite minor. You know, they're small things that you know that, that aren't going to be showstoppers, etc. And the majority of the time, when you're looking at machinery, it's not new machines it's not showstoppers but but we have turned up to us to a um to a large line once a brand new one fully automated um and uh various machinery and there was hundreds of thousands of pounds with the rectifications required mm-hmm. because it was nowhere near <laughs> and and that is it unfortunately it it's not that uncommon to, to find serious issues with 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 machinery of various ages and complexities. Well, we won't ask you to name that company just yet. No, I couldn't do that. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it, does, um, it does bring us on actually neatly to a pretty important question, which is, and I'd like to ask each of you, how would you advise your customers and prospects to approach automation and automation project? What are the, what are the things they should do? What are the things they shouldn't do? Let's, let's come back to you, Val, to start with. Yeah. What would you advise? It's a broad question, to be honest, yeah. <laughs> but it's a good question. Um, I think, first of all, you need to recognize what are the challenges in your warehouse. As I said, everybody can have different challenges in, in the warehouse. Can be can be a thing to keep it with the growth. It can be a quality issue. I think that's the first point where you need to start, see what you need, what, what are you looking for? And then I think you need to understand yeah, what is the solution I'm looking for? So some customers directly already have in mind what they need. Yeah, and then it's wise just to go out in the market, um, approach probably uh, suppliers, ask them for some advice, compare suppliers, what kind of advice are they giving? What is the feeling you have with the supplier? Um, the other way could be that you don't have a clue what you need. Sometimes I see also those customers, they, they, yeah, they have a warehouse, they have a process, but don't know what, what they want. And then it's just a matter of a kind of consultancy. Um, and we do also that to our customers. So we can do a kind of data analysis. We can see, okay, how does the process flow look like? What are the products you want to handle? Um, and then based on that, we can come up with an advice. Um, and then we can say either, okay, you, you might be um, a company where we can support you, but maybe you can better go to that company. I just want to be honest and maybe they can support you in a better way. 
Um, so that could also happen at the end of such a consultancy uh, project. But it depends a little bit um, yeah, how you want to approach that and what are your challenges mm -hmm. in your warehouse at that moment, I think. What, what do you think as, as, a, as a sorting specialist, what do you think is the biggest mistake your, your clients might make in advance that, that you discover that, that, you know, that they, when you meet them, you talk to them, you find that, well, actually your approach is wrong. What's the most common thing they get wrong? The, 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 the problem they, they have sometimes is they only look to the current situation. Where I see, just imagine where would you be in two, three years? Um, and then um, it would be good to already um, uh, think about maybe a phased approach. You say, okay, well, just install this system. It will take care of the current situation, but be flexible to the future so that you can enhance the, for instance, the capacity of the system, that you can maybe have more outputs of the system because, yeah, maybe you have to sort to more kind of uh, parcel operators or more kind of uh, depots. Um, so, yeah, make the customer aware that it's not only about today, but it's definitely also about tomorrow. And being flexible is the key word there. Sure. And, and what about the, the customer who might be worried about disruption to their processes while you guys come in and implement your incredible automated system? <laughs> What's your information times? Well, what we always try to do, and that's the key of project management at the end of the day, is that we don't want to much disturb the current process. But a lot of the systems we implement are green fields. But if it's a brown field, we basically would say, OK, we indicate how much of the area we need. We put some fences there. OK, I just look also to Jamie about safety there. <laughs> just then we, when we come on site, that, that, sure, that for sure the, the location where we implement the system, it's covered. And what we also often do, Paul, is that we come in with uh, double shifts. So we try to minimize the length of the installation time and the commissioning time. And that normally would, uh, would work. And we also ask already at the beginning, okay, what is the lowest, um, um, uh, yeah, what is in terms of flow, what is the, the slowest period in, in the year? And then in that period, we will come on site. It can be, for instance, during the holiday period, or maybe it's January, just after the peak. So that's also something we discuss with our clients. And then, yeah, then we make a plan together how we do the implementation. Okay, fantastic. Let me come back to you, Gianni, taking back to that original question, which is um, how should your clients approach an automation project? Yeah, so I think uh, Walter mentioned the, uh, the start of the journey, just being clear of the direction you're heading. So making sure that your priorities are right. And then I noticed that uh, many clients, especially first, you know, the people who do automation for the first time, uh, especially also smaller businesses, they often don't even have data sets. So where we would ideally use a, a data set and analyze what is the size of the SKUs, what is the inbound, mm -hmm. outbound. So many people don't have this. And so then we will indeed start with a kind of consulting trajectory where we have questionnaires uh, you know, what is the size of the SKU? What is the storage uh, number? Uh, what is the warehouse height? Uh, and also looking at the, at the growth forecast. Uh, to give you an example, I made a solution uh, some weeks ago for a spare parts company where we started with, uh, they are going for a new warehouse. And so we built the, uh, all the storage that they need now, about 25,000 storage locations. But the inbound and the outbound is very limited as they are developing their business. So there we only have two robots. So that's it's really, a, you know, it's a, it's a minimum inbound and outbound. But then we also look like at this, in this warehouse with this amount of storage locations, how many robots can we fit in? And how much inbound and outbound can this cover? Right, so in this particular case, we could fit in about 10 robots. So covering for, you know, that's, a, that's a quite a growth that you can cover for um, and then I think what is important also is just uh, the integration capacities of your new automation not only in terms of uh, integration with your WMS system but also integration with maybe other automation solutions like you have the sort of like you have the you know uh, pallet conveyors or whatever you may have so how do you integrate all these things Okay, fantastic. And I think you spoke earlier, didn't you, about the implementation time, that there are things you can do as a company to, so that processes are not disrupted. Yes, absolutely. So, um, uh, so just in general, um, maybe two points. 
uh, if you look at robotics, AMR solutions, they are very fast to implement. So like, uh, like I said, you might even be able to reuse your existing shelves. So uh, in general, I take for uh, like for uh, the JD project in, in the UK, the e-commerce warehouse where we installed 60 robots. Um, 60 robots, and I think it was um, about 40,000 storage locations. We spent on all one month installing the hardware and another month uh, optimizing performance before going live. So that's only two months for, uh, you know, for the whole system to, to be live and one month only to really being operational. So it means after one month, you have the system operational, not at full performance, but it's working, right? So that's, I think, one important thing, the speed of the installation. And the other thing is the, the modularity and the scalability. Like I mentioned, uh, you have this uh, manufacturing line. It cannot stop, or it can just stop very, very, uh, for a short period during, for example, the summer holidays. Uh, so there we might split uh, the warehouse into several parts. Also, for example, Booktopia, we have done it last year. It's an online uh, book retailer. So where we did the first phase last year, and now we're moving to the second phase. I see. Okay, thank you for that. Luana, advice for customers that are looking to embark on this project? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'll just kind of add on to Walter's point. Uh, being open to the future, I think, is the number one thing um, because, yeah, everyone kind of tries to solve the immediate here and now problem, but really without thinking about how is this going to completely change the way I operate in not even like years' time, maybe like six months' time, 12 months' time, once I have a bit more data. So that, that was a, a very good point. I just wanted to, to touch on that one. And, but the other element is also expectations. Um, so I think um, especially the, the customers are just starting on their automation journey, probably like all the media hype and seeing all the Amazon style warehouses, everyone's expecting robots to be able to do everything everywhere from day one. Um, so kind of doing that education <clears throat> with the customer, I think it's very important for all the different players in, in our sector because yeah, it, you, you can kind of, have to understand there are limitations of technology it's not a hundred percent just leave it out there it's going to do everything for you there's there's kind of things that the robots need to learn so for example like the, the autonomous navigation for from our perspective kind of getting more data points on the shelves so they understand the products that are on the shelves that takes a little bit of time and i think that's just something that customers need to get their heads around um, there's no like one fits all solution um, that's just going to be plugged in and then yeah work from from day one so expectations are always very very interesting to work with Okay, thank you for that. Um, Jamie, as we said before, you, you're providing sort of an essential service rather than installing a product like uh, like the, the rest of the guys here. But what, what sort of advice would you give in this area? I don't know if I can hear Jamie, no? I'm mute. You're mute, Jamie. No, okay. Yeah, there we we'll go. We'll come back. Oh, uh, we're back again. Uh, yeah, so Jamie, we talked to people around about the... Um, uh at, at the tender stage so you know for these guys at that point that you know people want to know, need to know exactly what they want out of their system to make sure they can supply the right solution and but from a safety perspective you've got to understand the implications you maybe have to look in for standards if it's a specific c type standards who's taking ownership and responsibility of certain parts of the process you know is other machinery so gianni's talking about um you know supplying machines that integrate with the existing racket at that point, are they supplying with a declaration of conformity and doing a full um, CE or UKCA mark solution? Or are they going to supply a declaration of incorporation because it's being put into a into an existing system, which isn't a full solution from, from them guys? So there's lots of areas that, that things sometimes fall down. Um, things coming in from, from over in Europe, into the UK, maybe they're not aware of, uh, of Lola, the lifting regs, they're working at height regs and things like that because with logistics centers there's lots of cranes you know so the rail pit uh crane systems etc so it's it's nailing that sort of bit down at the beginning who's taking ownership of what what information what documentation what certification is coming with the machinery and exactly what do you want the machinery certified to um like i say from from a standards perspective because the broad brush of um harmonized or, or in the uk now designated standards or directives slash regulations, maybe not always not always detailed enough to be able to make sure you get the compliance solution you're after at the end. Devil in the detail. Definitely. That's why you need pills. Okay, um, 
I think we're coming to the end of our time, but I just want to tell our audience, please do use the uh, question facility and our panelists will be delighted uh, to answer any questions, queries you may have. Um, but I do have one last question before I can let you all go. We've talked about in, in automation. It's always, automation is always about looking towards the future. So how does it look? How does your sector look in five years time? What are, what are customers going to be doing differently then? So let's start with you, Vata. <laughs> Yeah, if it's sometimes hard to predict, but I think <laughs> in general, what we see is, uh, I think if the majority of the customers we are working with is, is the e-commerce business and the parcel business. And I don't think it come, came to an end yet. Uh, still, there will be substantial growth for the future. And I think it will be a mix of, of, of bigger hubs on one end, but also what Johnny was mentioning about micro fulfillment. Um, so different solutions will be needed in this industry, uh, in this market. Um, what I think at the end of the day will be, and that's a little bit the buzzword we hear already for some time, it's the light out logistics. So at the end of the day, I think um, the mechanization will proceed, will be more mechanization in the, in the warehouses with less people at the end of the day. And that can be a mix of, of technology like conveyors and sorters, but also robotics uh, or even solutions we haven't think about. But the push will be directing towards more automation in the warehouses for sure. And especially in this, uh, in this area where there's a lack of uh, warehousing, uh, warehousing stuff. Okay, thank you for that. And Gianni? Yeah, so I... Uh... Totally agree. So lights out automation now is automation. The future is full automation. And so I think one of the major challenges for the future, and that's uh, obviously also the opportunity for now is you have all these kinds of different equipments with different suppliers, specialists in their area. How do these, uh, you know, interconnect? What is the interoperability? Uh, and I think software is very important, mm -hmm. which software is taking control of all the equipment how do they talk to each other and then you have questions like you know who is in charge uh, who is taking care of you know what about the efficiency uh, accountability and questions like this yeah all good points uana any views on this i mean the way i see it is there's been a couple of big moments in, in the logistics industry, right? The, the pallet, the container, the forklift, um, from, from our perspective, automation and, and data behind it is, is the next big one. Uh, so it's already here and it's only gonna become more and more fundamental to the way the whole the, the supply chain kind of operates beginning to, to end. Um, so I think, yeah, just to add to everyone's point, I think it's it's one of those big inflection points in an industry that's really gonna revolutionize the way it's, uh, it's working in the future. Thank you very much. And uh, Jamie? I mean, from a safety perspective, um, my impression in the nine years I've been with Pilts is that is that people's uh, knowledge on safety and uh, and the way and taking it a lot more seriously over that time. So um, it's becoming more predominant within the marketplace now, whereas uh, previously it was, you know, it wasn't given as much attention. As well, it's it, regulation now as well, isn't it? There always has been, but it's it's just becoming with 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 the um, with life in general. You know, mm. not just in the automation sector, people are more aware of of safety and and, and things like that. Anyway, so um, yeah, so it's just a, it's a it's a growing market. It's something that's being taken more seriously, um, and yeah, I can only see it going one way, and that's going to continue. It's certainly growing, um, and on that note. Let me thank our panelists for some incredible insight. Um, automation is a very exciting area. I think we're going to see a lot of development and I think all the businesses you've talked about providing very exciting contributions to that area. So as I say, any questions from our audience, please do contact us at Logistics Business or use the facility on the screen. And I'm sure our contributors will be delighted to uh, hook up with you in the future should you wish to speak to them. So on that note, thank you very much. Thank you.